kick things off. Okay, the recording has begun. All right, welcome everybody to the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. Everybody is welcome to attend and participate in this meeting so long as you abide by the required antitrust policy that you see in front of you and abide by our uh, community code of conduct, uh, which is basically to make sure that you're respectful of all of the other participants. Uh, we have a good number of updates later in the agenda today, so we're going to try to allocate enough time to get through all of those. I hope that everybody's had the chance to go through and do their pre-reads of them so that we can primarily just ask for uh, questions and clarifications during that, that period. Uh, so flowing into the announcements here, uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't think there's anything new to announce with the CICD other than there's the, the link of how to get involved there if you are uh, somebody with an interest in, in uh, how we evolve those capabilities. Uh, Rai, you want to give us the announcement on the Fabric uh, workshop there? Sure. So uh, July 8, 9, 10, 11 at our, the LF offices in San Francisco, we're going to be holding a, well, uh, a four-day meeting uh, to develop the curricula for the Hyperledger Certified Fabric uh, Developer Program. Uh, this is very similar to the Fabric Administrator and Sawtooth Administrator uh, certification and training that we developed. Um, this is in person and we don't uh, provide for travel or we don't provide uh, you know, a hotel, but we do feed you when you're there. And we are looking for subject matter experts to uh, get on board and help us uh, develop the curriculum. and. Dan participated in one of those efforts uh, for Sawtooth, so he has some expertise. Uh, if you want to get involved, get in touch. Thanks. All right, thanks, Ray. Hey, Dan. Uh, I, I was muted. I was like, hey, no, I have something to say about CSD. Oh, sorry, um, go Real ahead. quick, um, I, we reevaluated our choice to, or I reevaluated my choice to keep the CICD section on the wiki private. Um, there was some confidential information in there that I have, you know, like corporate expenditures and stuff like that on this. I have kept that uh, private, but the whole section is now public. You can search for CICD uh, in the search bar. Um, I'll be dropping links into the wiki so you can see the meeting minutes and kind of see where the discussion is at right now. Um, we're trying to solve Docker and Docker. That's the big problem. So if you've got any interest in that, um, we have a call tomorrow morning and um, we'd love to see you there. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, is Karen on? I saw her join. Yeah, uh, all right. I Karen, see Karen listed in the um, attendees there. Who want to give us uh, a quick shout out for the uh, Sao Paulo boot camp? Looks like uh, Karen is looking for volunteers there. And I think what we're doing with the, the boot camps is we're trying to uh, ramp new contributors into the projects or to develop on top of the projects. Right. We're looking for people who um, can show up and help us uh, get new contributors on board. Um, and I know that uh, Nathan has been to two of the boot camps and perhaps, you know, he could speak to that experience, but Karen, you're still muted. So if you have anything to say. Okay, uh, I encourage people to just go ahead and follow that link then, and that will uh, take you to some of the information about that event. Uh, I guess particularly if you are a Portuguese speaker, that would be uh, a welcome addition to that volunteer staff. Yeah, that, that was one correct. of the big and things about the Hong Kong one. Oh, sorry, Karen, go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 it's actually Daniela. Um, somehow Karen's muted, can't unmute. Um, that is correct. Um, we are also looking for English um, speakers, you know, who want to run sessions. And we do have, you know, volunteers on site um, that can help with translation and kind of doing that. So, you know, a key thing here is obviously just like we did in Hong Kong is do translation of materials. So we have a very enthused and very active, you know, active um, population in Brazil that want to get involved. So if you even want to consider it, please reach out to us, talk to us about it, and we'll see um, how we can make it happen. And even if we want to assist in having some people on the ground lead the sessions and you want to mentor them, that is fantastic as well. Just let us know. 
This is how we scale. Okay. Bragato. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move along then. We have uh, just a, a few items to go through with, with some discussion. Uh, for a while now, we've had some backlog items that relate to the project lifecycle. Uh, David put together a, a few versions of, of uh, some thoughts when uh, this had come up earlier. We recently had another thread on projects and subprojects, uh, and there's been uh, some dialogue also about uh, how we deal with with projects that are maybe at the end of their life cycle, which isn't something that we've we've dealt with. Uh, in the, the longevity of hyperleisure yet. And uh, it seems like maybe the most efficient way to draw this together is if we could put together a small committee uh, led by uh, some TSC member or members that can come back to the, the TSC with a recommendation on any updates that we need to that life cycle. Uh, I think the, the original and uh, subsequent versions of the life cycle, I recall being um, uh, heavily uh, influenced by uh, Arnaud's experience, and, and I wonder if, if Arnaud, if you'd be willing to take point on this activity. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Thanks, Arnaud. Um, Mick, it looks like you are uh, on now, or maybe working your way on. I'm on. Excellent. So you had also expressed some some views in this area. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, I think Salona and I were talking also about the group subgroup issues as well last week. So okay, great. So happy to express my opinion in there, <laughs> but I will defer to Arno's experience. So great. So um, Dan. Yes, if I, Mark. If I can interject here for a minute. So the group subgroup thing is something we probably need to talk about in the future as well. But is that something this group should go off and look at, since it's related to life cycle, or is that a separate thing completely? Mick, was that an allusion to working groups or to projects? To projects. I mean, we had that. We've had that groups or project sub project kind of discussion multiple times and I think at some point we're going to have to roll it into um, one of these bigger discussions. Yeah, I don't know that I would want to get too distracted by that if I may say put it that way. Well, yeah. I mean, I think there is general questions that have been brought up with regard to the life cycle just in terms of, you know, uh, we don't now always have clearly defined exit criteria for one transition to another. Is it possible to get to go back into the, the the life cycle steps? And you know, I think we can already look at all of that. And with that getting into the question of the sub projects. And once we've done that, I think we could indeed entertain the idea of, you know, tackling the sub project, but I wouldn't want to put that up front. I, I agree, but I think they're kind of related in that if something, the the life cycle, I think of a sub project is going to be a lot easier to define, right? Because sub projects can pop in and out of existence under the governance of the the maintainers of a project, right? Fabric can create a, a new SDK that lives for six months and they decide they don't want to do it and they can close the repo and it's not a big deal, uh, you know, compared to having something spread out on top. I, I, I think they're related. No, but I, I don't disagree with that. But I think what I was trying to say is that I, I, I would think that the sub project stuff is will be easier to deal with once we have tackled the life cycle project question. And then this is all I, I, I don't I, you know, I don't think we want to deal with the whole thing at once. This is all I'm saying. I see what you're saying. I agree. Yes. Yeah, sequence, sequencing these discussions makes an awful lot of sense. <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely. I do think that they're. I do think they're related, but I think we can make progress on the life cycle one without the 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 project sub project is going to be a much harder discussion. So. It seems like it. <laughs> I agree. That's why I'm hesitant to say let's not mix everything at once because 
I think we can make progress on life cycle outside of the sub project discussions, and I don't want to derail that. Uh, you know, but fail to 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 grab that uh, low hanger low low hanging fruit. Yeah, and if it's if it's not too distracting, if you can can consider scope, especially uh, in the entrance criteria for uh, for new projects, maybe make a little headway on on the sub project sub project without opening too much of that can of worms. Right. Uh, as far as timeline, uh, do you have a, a sense with whether you'd be able to come back in something like two weeks, three weeks, a month. Maybe you need some time to reflect on that, but. It, yeah, it's a bit hard to say up front without having a first discussion with others who are interested in participating and get a sense of where people stand and how big of an issue we have to deal with. Fair enough. Um, but I, I'm happy to, you know, for us to have a first, you know, chat about this and then get a better sense and then I can tell you more next time. All right. On the next, you know, the next opportunity. Okay, great. Uh, so I will, uh, I will uh, leave it to uh, you guys then to pull together people uh, for the right forums and, and so forth, whether that's email, chat, voice to, to move that along. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, all right, Dave, you have uh, something on the agenda here for the did work. Yeah, so um, I'm going to keep this like two to three minutes because we have a ton of quarterly reports to get to. Um, I know that all of you have heard the decentralized identity people talking about did a lot. Um, if you've even been tangentially involved with Indy um, and, you know, maybe some of the other projects out in Ethereum like Uport. Um, when I, so uh, Solana, myself, Brian, were all at the Internet Identity Workshop a few weeks ago, and I presented some work that I had been working on for a year or so. Ever since Rye and Tracy and I had discovered that we have a DCO problem um, in our code bases, I had just started thinking about this in conjunction with what Indy can offer and decentralized identifiers, and I'd been slowly chewing on it for like a year. And then Richard Esplin forced my hand when he proposed an internship project of signing Git commits using DIDs. And so I decided to, well, I emailed him like a huge essay. If you ask him, it's like five pages long, explaining all the intricacies that I had worked out in my own time. And then I went to IIW to present it. And it got a lot of traction. There's a group already of about eight contributors who are contributing on an active basis. It's currently in my personal repo. Uh, on GitHub, the W3C um, DID working group has already accepted the DID method um, spec in their registry, and we're just trying to finalize that. This has a huge impact on the future of all software development, not just Hyperledger, and um, I just wanted to keep you guys up to date on it. This will allow, like the DID, the did get method is um, a way of normalizing how we would store identity data inside a Git repo, because repos are essentially like a blockchain, so you could use a Git repo as an anchor of trust. But this also has implications for, let's say we have hyperledger identities anchored on, say, the Sovereign Network, you know, on Indy, um, we could use those identities to sign our code too. And with some small tweaks to our governance and, and um, acceptance criteria for commits, we could drive our um, DCO problem out of existence. We could make sure that we have 100% signed commits and, and um, uh, acceptance of the DCO and our licensing and our code of conduct and all of that stuff. So um, if you want to know more about that, um, come and contact me and I'll plug you into the existing group outside of Hyperledger. I know this is kind of a, an odd place to talk about it, but I'm thinking that we should probably bring it in as a Hyperledger lab because it's a very narrow thing, but I just want to let everybody know what's going on. This is an example of what we on the Hyperledger staff worry about, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and this actually is one of those rare cases where it's translating into code and a standard and hopefully widespread adoption. All right. I think I'm at about three minutes. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, all right. Task force for 
uh, is it convector? Yeah. And so I may just interject before. I mean, I just want to point out, Dave. I, I posted a response to your email with question you never responded to. So, <laughs> thank uh, Arno. I'm still trying to dig out. I've been gone for like two weeks. I was on vacation and then face to face in New York and all that stuff. So I I will get to it. I did see it. I apologize uh, um, for my uh, tardy response. Thank you. Go ahead, Dan. Sorry. Okay, uh, Convector is a lab that we accepted, a, uh, you know, a little bit ago, and uh, it's it's an interesting, uh, you know, smart contract uh, development engine. And what we want to do is see what would that take to bring that in as a project if it is worthy of becoming a project, and taking a look at it from the standpoint of could we get this to be part of a composer and perhaps a composer, uh, part of composer or a composer replacement or something along those lines. So that is the point of the task force. If you want to join, uh, get in contact, thanks. Okay. Um, so if somebody is looking at getting involved or learning more about Convector, they would go to the, the labs repositories then and, and look for a Convector repository? Yep and uh hop on chat etc and there's okay. there's documentation for that on the labs repo question okay. that was a question is there more oh. documentation on it there uh i will have to go and take a look i don't know that off the top of my head i'm going to guess the answer is yes but okay thank you uh yeah and i i think for new kinds of transaction execution. It'd be great to take a look at that in, uh, in the context of the transact project that we had just, uh, that we had just uh, approved recently. So maybe keep that in mind as you're taking a look at that too. All right. Uh, quarterly reports. Uh, I saw that, that Mark did get the, the PSWG in, uh, very recently, but I don't think people have had a chance to read through that yet. So why don't we set that one for next week and we can have a, a broader discussion on that one because I think Mark is looking for uh, some feedback directly to the PSWG in that discussion as well. Uh, can we go ahead then and move straight into the borough update? I think that one has been up for long enough that, that people should have had an opportunity to get through it. Uh, just to maybe get things going with that. One question that I had uh, as I looked through that, and you may have already responded to me on, on chat, uh, didn't notice yet this morning, but uh, you mentioned that one of the new features in Burrow is that state is stored in a mutable forest. For those of us who are in uh, uh, fairly unchanging copses of trees at the moment, do you want to maybe explain what that is? Sure, yeah, I, I picked that up. Um, uh, so the, the, the mutable forest is just actually the, the, uh, the, the top level object. Um, the, the change in a more understandable way is we, we had a uh, type of Merkle tree, um, which is a version of Merkle tree called IAVL that um, came out of Tendermint. Um, what the forest idea does is it arranges uh, groups of these trees where each tree has its root, state root in a top level tree. So it's kind of a, tr uh, a hierarchy of trees because um, we, uh, an IAVL tree doesn't have a stable prefix root like a prefix tree would, but actually it's very useful to have that for separate uh, parts of the state. So it's kind of a hybrid um, uh, prefix or Patricia tree over an AVL tree. The mutable thing is probably a bit of a red herring. So um, <clears throat> you write into the mutable tree, um, which is your working set for the for the block as the block gets applied. And then once that's saved, all of the the, uh, the trees underneath that mutable forest get saved into an immutable forest. Um, for which, and, and you have access to every immutable forest for every previous version. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of an internal thing, but it was it was a bit of a uh, re reasonably big change on the on the state back end. Um, but uh, 
the upshot is we, we, we can query um, kind of independently and get smaller proofs for um, various elements of state at any block um, with all reads going back to an immutable version of the uh, of the tree slash forest and then the mutable bit is just mutable in the sense that it's it's being bashed uh, as a block is applied and if we crash we'll throw away the mutable bit so we are still uh, immutable too okay and uh you'd also mentioned proofs in that is is that related to the concept of state proofs from um from indie not from indie so this is this is uh merkle tree proof so this is uh not something that is directly oh, exposed is but is yeah yeah this is just a but it is a core feature of the the state mechanism for future stuff uh for light clients and for some cross train chain stuff so we okay, can provide so like a like a merkle path and, and, and that yeah stuff. yeah it's a merkle path or and there's also some range proofs and some other stuff yeah okay cool All right, uh, other questions on the Burrow update? I have a, one higher level question for Silas. Um, so Burrow's kind of been the, the Ethereum-esque project in, in Hyperledger. Um, I was just curious, kind of moving forward, do, does the Burrow team plan to sort of stay in lockstep with like the changes in Ethereum 2 and EWASM and those sort of things, or does it is it more have a life of its own at this point? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so I have followed with some interest uh, some of the Ethereum 2 work. It is quite um, sort of distributed, that work, and a lot of it has moved quite slowly. Um, Sean, who actually prepared the borough update and is on the call now, um, has been working on uh, some interesting WASM stuff with his uh, uh, Solidity compiler that compiles to WASM. And I think that we're going to end up um, kind of uh, experimenting with Burrow uh, and a WASM before eWASM is really pinned down. But we will certainly try and make the most of any standards that may actually make sense for us um, coming from, uh, from Ethereum 2. And then I think the other direction for, for Burrow is kind of, um, I mean, we, we run it in production as something that some, some vague definitions of what a side chain is but um th there is a general desire for us to provide uh side chain features so this includes things like asset uh, asset transfer from um from mainline ethereum um or the running offloading of smart contracts that could be run on public ethereum run for zero or small cost um and this kind of thing so in terms of the kind of general direction um uh, that's the other thing we'd like to do that, that involves having that impedance match with um, public Ethereum. Uh, last time I looked, eWASM like, didn't have a, a clear ABI set out for it, but I could be out of date. Uh, now, hi, this is Sean. And the other thing to point out is um, we, we updated um, our testing to Solidity uh, 05 and we added some opcodes um, for Solidity 05. So we, we, at the moment we are keeping um, track of, of Solidity as is. Um. Okay, great. Yeah, yes. I really appreciate the uh, for people not, response. For people not versed in, in perhaps in, in public theorem, so the, the, the sort of Ethereum 2 work, there's uh, various things around uh, execution engine based on a, a subset of WASM. Um, and also scaling proposals, which is kind of linked to that. But then what public Ethereum has is quite a significant weight of finding a way to make all the existing contracts work. So there are such things as EVMs written in Solidity, um, which are fairly horrifying. Um, and, and the idea of sort of compiling them to WASM and then running your old contracts in that. And so there's various things going around, but it's, it's, it's changing the jet engine in flight stuff. So I suspect we will get to some kind of wasm -y thing um, at which point we will also see if we can, if there's anything we could share or use around Transact, I think. Um, but we'll probably end up there before public Ethereum is settled on that stuff. I, I really like the idea of a Solidity, a compiler for Solidity to EWASM. And um, with, uh, I mean, that might even be a, 
a separable kind of chunk that if it was something that would be appealing to other parts of, you know, the Ethereum community, the, the public Ethereum community, like if we, you know, had some sort of an open door to them. I mean, I, I, it just, that's kind of fun and it might be a way to reach out even beyond the existing borough user base. Um, uh, just a thought. This is Brian. So. Hi, this is Sean. So um, I'm, I'm working on the, on Solang and in, um, so I've, I've, I've got some basic um, contracts working, um, but I really could use some, uh, some help. So if anyone's interested in uh, working on that particular piece, um, I'd be very happy to work with them. So what we should mention here, um, we try to plug this as much as we can. Um, Solang is a project that Sean started. It's, it's a Hyperledger Labs project now. Um, and it is an LLVM backed um, Solidity to WASM compiler. Um, so yeah, we, we'd really like to, to make any connections we can there, Brian, totally. Yeah, that, that sounds like a great way that if we could start bringing in some of the, uh, the broader Ethereum community into this work. So the, the immediate plans are to um, um, put a, a WASM uh, virtual machine into Borough, and then we can um, demonstrate um, solidity with the WASM, um, solidity to WASM sort of end-to-end. -end. Um, so that's one of the um, things I'm working on now. And the initial sand pit for this is we have our, we have our kind of extension functions that are hard hard coded in Go at the moment. Um, so historically, we've been called them S natives. Um, so the first relatively small piece we'd like to do is uh, have the dynamic extension of those as uh, kind of WASM modules that can be called from the EVM. Um, so we have a calling convention from the EVM to this sort of native Go code that's hard, hard coded. So this what a kind of a nice step anyway, if we can get it to work is so to be able to call uh, dynamically deployed uh, WASM code um, from Solidity contracts, but using the same extension mechanism. Okay, great. So I see in your, your issues that you list tools and documentation. Um, when it comes to tools, is it just these things that we were talking about or is uh, anything else that you would like to highlight there? We don't have a web-free interface yet, so that would be um, some tooling that would be useful for us. Um, as for documentation, um, on the on the on the hyperledger chat, there's there's a fair amount of interest. Uh, but we're, we're sort of discovering that we have um, features that people are interested in, but we don't have any documentation. Um, so we have, so we that's that's one thing that we could uh, that would really help us because we do have features that, that people like, but if they don't know how to use them, they're not that much use. Yeah, and this is this is a problem that can't, I don't think it can be seeded by the community, but but one thing we're, we're trying to do it, well, in Monat, trying to do this, this this happy hour thing on a Friday, and part of that is gonna, I'm gonna be forcing myself to do half an hour of documentation. I've got a PR open on Borough at the moment, but um, my plan was to try and get kind of coverage, but make it kind of probably not at all in depth enough and then kind of hoping that some of the interested people on borough chat room which there's been an uptick in like uh like good questions on there which is kind of promising but maybe people are going to be interested in picking that up um on the web3 thing we have a we have we have an internship proposal that is uh, uh obviously quite detailed for someone to start we also had uh talks with um fat fabric fab free um guys so they have a quite a, a, a well uh, encapsulated uh, Web3 interface. So this is the standard Ethereum JSON RPC interface um, that is a kind of standalone thing. Um, and they had agreed in principle to spin that out into another project. It hasn't happened, I guess, because we didn't get the intern and push on it. But if there's anyone who wanted to take up that project, I don't think it'd be that hard. Like Fabric has done a lot of the work uh, and it could benefit, benefit both projects and we'd, um, we'd have it as a dependency in Burrow. Uh, and then we'd be able to use um, uh, the uh, Ethereum uh, like web plugins, um, so MetaMask and things like that, ultimately to do things like uh, a local signing in a browser and all that kind of stuff, which we don't have access to now. Okay. Uh, I would like to suggest that if there's anybody on the call from the um, Learning Materials Development Working Group, that maybe an opportunity to 
uh, ramp on burrow and, and kill two birds with one stone would be to participate on that uh, documentation exercise. Um, I definitely will look into it. It's Bobby, and I definitely will um, put that on our t uh, list. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, uh, thanks for the update, Borough team. Do we have uh, somebody on the, the call to represent the Cello project? Uh, yes, Dan. This is Tong. Hi, Tong. Um, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and kick off the first question then again here. Um, just looking to see real quickly if there was a response on uh, accessibility. I think that question was probably a bit out of the blue. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think for, for all of our projects that, that focus on some sort of uh, user experience or, or actual direct uh, interface surface, it's good to think about um, how usable that is in, in a variety of dimensions, including accessibility. Um, mm -hmm. so not to put you on the spot f to, to answer that, but if you have any thoughts about the design of cello in regard to that, or that maybe as a future priority for your backlog, I'd like to hear about that. Right, that's right. We, I mean, um, this tool has a user interface, so the accessibility naturally comes to, to mind. Um, we actually use this uh, framework um, I'm hoping that most of the uh, those kind of issues addressed by the framework, but we haven't really tested uh, uh, just accessibility uh, sort of requirement. And uh, I wasn't really uh, familiar with this thing. And uh, I actually answered the question at the, I think uh, a while back. Um, as I said, we haven't tested this, but uh, certainly will be something we can um, start the discussion and see what we can do after the 1.0 release. Yeah, that's a good point. I told maybe we need to find some uh, expert on the accessibility. Do, is there a way to pull some of this then so each project is enough figuring out accessibility on their own? Um, maybe some guidelines from Hyperledger or Linux Foundation or something on what we'd like to see. So we have consistent accessibility across all projects. Yeah, I, I think that uh, if, if we have contributors that are experienced in user interface design, this would be a great way to sort of broaden that impact if you want to put together um, some best practices for for accessibility, maybe uh, useful toolkits. I think there's there's bound to be some diversity in implementation based on different uh, languages and SDKs that are being produced. Uh, okay. But wherever there's an opportunity for for reuse and communicating best practices, I think we'd all appreciate that. I mean, cross board. How I mean, how other projects actually address this issue? I mean, how many how many projects actually should have this issue? I'm not I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think um, Explore comes to mind as as another project that has a strong user interface focus. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, any of the projects that are presenting. Uh, surface, especially things that, that have a web interface. Uh, I would hope to see some accessibility design from each of those and, and uh, I plan to be asking about those in upcoming project reports. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Right, other topics for Cello? Um, um, I think the most, it's just a couple of things. Uh, one is the uh, the activities in the past quarter, then the plans we have for the future. Um, we have added the you know this fabric one point four point one release. Um, you can use a raft, so we added the raft to support. If you use the cello um, Ansible agent, you will be able to set up your fabric network 
Not, you, not only by using Kafka, you can also choose to use Raft. Uh, we also added the capability that uh, you can use Trello to set up just, let's say, um, I only care about the peers in my organization. You can just set up peers or say, hey, I don't care about any uh, peers and I'm hosting older system. You can do that or you can do both. So that has been what uh, the, the Trello always um, support. And now you can just choose to just do peers or orders. Um, we also added the capability that allow you to expose the uh, fabric metrics, um, those ports. Uh, you can choose, just switch uh, uh, a flag. You'll be able to say, hey, I want to enable this. Or I don't want to um, uh, you know, enable this. With the, uh, some of the work from the uh, fabric interop working group, uh, now we have a formally defined the process how an existing organization can join, how a new organization can join existing fabric network. So we have that process defined. Now if you use Cello to set up your peer or set up an ordering system, Cello uh, will be able to generate those artifacts that you can send to um, existing uh, fabric network admins for joining your new organization, or you say, hey, I only have an ordering system, and now uh, your organization already approved to have peers join, here's the earned points, uh, certificates that you can use to join your peers. So those artifacts that are necessary, expanding your fabric network will be created while you actually set up those things. So we have also started work on the improve the user dashboard. Uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, it's a lot easier to use, uh, more dynamic. Uh, you can add your peers, um, let's say more from um, Kubernetes cluster, your peers running in there. Uh, you'll be able to do that. Uh, and we actually did uh, quite a bit of work, improve the document and fix some bugs. You can see the current plan um, doesn't change much from the last uh, quarter update. We still have only four uh, maintainers in this project. That's okay. uh, pretty much everything. All right, thanks, Tong. Uh, any last questions for Cello? All right, uh, well, thanks for, for updating us, Cello team. Uh, Explore. Do we have a representative from your project? Hello, uh, my name is Nick. Uh, I am supporting Hyperledger Explorer. Uh, so this is my first time to report, so apologies if I'm kind of like haven't been uh, in such uh, auditorium and uh, apologies. So uh, the project health is green. We released uh, version three Point nine point one. Uh, we are working on uh, graduating the project from incubation. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, despite we have uh, two point five resources, people are not. People are wishing to join, but what's happening when they get their hands on real coding, then they excuse themselves with the front uh, uh, issues that they are busy on their task and so on. So we are, we are still going into uh, uh, removing the, uh, graduating from the incubation. Uh, we did, redesign explorer to use uh, the discovery service and the new gateway uh, a part of uh, fabric network uh, using the wallet identity um, and we are working on updating uh, the test cases, introducing, we introduced the automated test cases. Um, 
working on bug fixes and uh, new features of 1.4 fabric and uh, i'm planning to also uh, give a test of uh, latest 1.4.1 uh, fabric release uh, i think that's that's a wall again we are very low on uh, contributors and it is very hard to uh, recruit people so as i mentioned before that is all my update all right well thank you for the update nick and also thank you for i see you added the jira task for accessibility design uh, do we have any other questions for the Explorer project? I guess I'll just chime in uh, one other point uh, that, that's already in the, the comment thread for the update, which is that the, the charter, I think for Explorer sought to encompass the Hyperledger projects. And so please continue to think about how you either recruit support or develop uh, features to um, support that that breadth of projects. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, I, uh, myself, I even was actively trying to recruit through the LinkedIn, sending to my connections, actively masking people in the chat. But again, some are wishing and are willing, but I don't see no much contribution. So people are busy on their project and they have their own tasks, so. Certainly. All right, thank you, Nick. Okay. All right. Um, hey, Dan. Nick, yeah. Dan? Hey, Dan. This is Dave Hughesby. I've got a, a quick question for the Explorer project. I um, became aware of a security vulnerability in one of the dependencies of the Explorer project, and I filed a security bug yesterday or two days ago, and I wanted to ask Nick, who on the Explorer project is willing to, or should I talk to about fixing security bugs? Because yeah, they don't absolutely. have I, wide I am visibility, and I need a volunteer to add to that list. Uh, I'm, I'm working on that now. I saw that. We we had a merge into the master, and I saw that, and, and, and other branch so I'm working on that now I, I hope well, to be what is a day or two what is your LFID and FRUNZA oh, okay yep so that's you that I'm talking okay yes correct yes I, I'm working I, I know that I'm aware of <laughs> any any security vulnerability I, I keep track I'm, I'm I'm watching I would say 14 hours a day <laughs> So, wow. Well, I'm not imposing a deadline. I just wanted to make sure that I was talking to the right people. Yeah. Dave, I think how we have things organized, uh, we have one or more maintainers from each project on the security mailing list. Yeah, Dan, I've had on a to-do list for a couple of weeks, months or so, that list and refresh it. So I think this is a good uh, impetus to raise that in my priority list. So if you have volunteered for the security team in the past, you'll probably get an email from me here soon um, on the mailing list. And I'm just gonna ping everybody and see if you still wanna be on the list. And then I'll figure out which projects are missing and we'll add some new people. All right, and then proactively, if you're listening to this and you are a project maintainer and you don't know who your project security representative is, you should probably figure that out and make sure you're connected with Dave. <laughs> yeah, yep, that's a good idea. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see if I can uh, make rise screen work here. Oh, maybe rise back, great. All right, technical working group China. Who do we have on from the uh, working group today? Hi, Dan, I will do the report. All right, Bawa, thank you. Okay, so overall the working group is just uh, working as planned. Uh, we we continued uh, regular bi-weekly meeting 
And in order to make more people suitable to attend the meeting, we have a voting and change the time of the meeting from the morning to uh, the evening every uh, Wednesday, uh, China time. And uh, averagely there will be uh, more than 10 or even more than 20 participants for the meeting. Uh, so in this quarter, we are glad to see that uh, the uh, contributors, they show interest not only to uh, project fabric and sawtooth, but also to projects like uh, Indy and uh, Ursa. And uh, hopefully we, we would expect more uh, interest also to other projects. And uh, for the documentation work, we uh, nearly finished the translation of the Fabric 1.4 documentation and also started the 2.0 documentation. And we uh, have tried the several platforms and finally we now move to the Transifex and uh, the contributors think uh, it's uh, quite efficient to do the translation with the Transifex. And uh, for the meetups, we uh, have uh, eight meetups in this quarter. And uh, uh, the cities include Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Changsha, and uh, Hangzhou. You can see it's uh, 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 diverse in geography. And also, uh, we have one more um, call volunteers. Uh, Cheng Yang, he's uh, nominated and accepted. He's from uh, Meitu, uh, one, one China company. And uh, overall, I, I think uh, the group is uh, going on well. And uh, before I jump to the issues, to the global, uh, to the to the TSC, uh, is there any questions? Okay, um, then I will continue with the issues I want, want to propose to the TSC. There are two major issues. Uh, the first one is uh, we have evaluating the Transifex platform for the documentation translation. And uh, we feel it's uh, very efficient. Uh, however, if we do not find there's any uh, place replacement uh, within the community tools. You know, the Transifex itself is uh, it's, uh, commercial and uh, currently we try to think out how to uh, integrate our translated results with uh, the other community tools like uh, the, the Garrett or GitHub repos. So we, we, we will look for uh, some suggestion from the GSC. Any suggestion on this topic? Maybe you could just say that question one more time in case people misunderstood. Oh yeah. Uh, currently, we we have finished the the the, uh, the translation of the Fabric One Point Four documentation, and it's uh, using a platform called uh, Transifex, and uh, we want to see how we can. Um, like leverage the translated results better with the, the community tool, community, com, community tools. And so normally where do the work products of that effort go? Are they, they're being committed into a, a Hyperledger Labs repository? Through yeah. GitHub? And so you're wondering like, are, are there artifacts generated by trans effects that are not going into source control? And you're wondering about that? Yeah, the lab is, uh, is, a, is a good direction. And uh, one more thing I, I can uh, imagine might be the learning and education working group. I'm not sure whether, yeah, they are interested with the, the translated results. Is, is the question really around how do you bring the translated output into read the doc so that somebody could choose uh, Chinese or Mandarin as their 
uh, selected format when they're actually looking at the official documentation. Yeah, I think um, uh, if we can integrate the transfects into read the doc directly, that will be helpful as a first step. And since it's not free, you have to pay for it. Is that what it, the problem is? The uh, now we do not pay for the transfects. But uh, we think it might not be a, a perfect place to hold all the translated documentations because it's, uh, it's uh, out of the control from the library community. So what do you commit to the, the labs repo then? So then you suggest that we uh, host all the results into the hyperledger lab, right? I, I'm not suggesting something new. I, I was under the impression that the translations that you're producing for Fabric are going into one of the lab repositories. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And so I'm not clear what, what is going into the lab, what is not going into the lab repository already. Yeah, but the lab repository is, uh, is only some place to host the results. Why is uh, not a good tool for doing the collaboration on the translation? So now we're using the transfix. I think I'm hearing two issues here. Um, one is where can you work on the translation itself? And two is where can you publish it? And I think the last time we yeah. looked at TransFX, there was, they do have open source licensing. Uh, mm -hmm. I might be thinking of a different tool. And I think the, the other issue is how does, how do we get the, the results of the lab folded into the Fabrics Docs project itself? That is, am I understanding you correctly there? Yeah, that's true. All right, well, it sounds like maybe the, the second question might be the easiest because it seems like that's a uh, fabric project question that, that hopefully the fabric maintainers can drive resolution with. Do you feel like okay. you have an effective communication path with the fabric maintainers? <laughs> okay, I think uh, we can continue to discuss this with the fabric maintainer teams. Okay, uh, thanks for the suggestions. And the other issue is uh, actually, it's uh, initially proposed by Wei Ping. Uh, he suggests that we can attract more people to attend other working groups and meetings. And uh, uh, I think we can extend this uh, question uh, or suggestion to like how we can um, improve the communications between the T, uh, TWC and uh, other projects and also working groups. Uh, one thing we, we have done is we promote the, info, uh, the information of the meetings in, in, in our regular meeting. And also I think it might be a good idea if uh, there, are, there can be some uh, volunteers from other projects and uh, working groups they can help uh, attend the TWC meeting and uh, make some uh, simple introduction there. Uh, last, uh, at the end of, of the last year, uh, we, we are glad we have some volunteer from the Sawtooth project. And he briefly introduced Sawtooth project and uh, it uh, did help people to get involved into the project. And uh, that I think it might be a very good way. So, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it might be not a question, but uh, I still uh, welcome for any suggestions or otherwise. And I, I think you, what we found was a, um, a, a Chinese, native Chinese speaker who was a, a Sawtooth contributor to speak in that event. Yeah. Um, is it required that, that somebody from one of the other projects 
uh, is it required that they speak Chinese in order to participate in that meeting? Oh, not really. I think English should be okay, but uh, the time might be a problem. The current time is uh, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, the China, the Beijing time, it should be very early for the Eastern time. So. Okay, well, still fair enough. I think it's a, a fair request that for each of the projects that wants to get better integrated with the China Working Group, um, prov provide a, a presenter, I'm sure, uh, who can work out the logistics of getting up early at, on one occasion. Yeah, we will thank uh, for any volunteer. Uh, by the way, uh, this is Vipin. Um, we are going to hold uh, on May 29th, actually May 30th, uh, 1 a.m. Uh, 1 a.m. UTC, which would be a good time in China, the Identity Working Group meeting. Uh, so, I mean, if needed, I can show up on the TS, uh, on the TW uh, China Working Group uh, call uh, and talk about the Identity Working Group. Yeah, sure. Weiping, you are always welcome. Just brush up your Chinese before Weiping. Yeah, I know. I it's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Xie Xie. Any other uh, thanks? <laughs> Uh, all right, so I think we're we're running just about out of time. So, uh, any last question for Bawa? All right. Well, thank everybody for your participation um, in uh, today's just, call. Oh, I just one last comment uh, for the documentation translation. Basically, uh, uh, I think there's an issue like who's going to commit those uh, uh, generated artifacts to the Git repo because that. I suppose should be signed off. I mean, ideally that could be a CICD job to like periodically pull translated artifact from Transifex into GitHub and assigned by some bot. I think this probably, this might be a problem and might be a broader in scope if other projects are translated as well. Yeah, I agree. I think that our requirements would be that they have uh, a human doing the sign off. Uh, and not just doing the sign off, it's whoever has made that contribution. When they make that contribution, it has to include the uh, effectively the developer certificate of origin. Yeah, I mean, currently we credit contributors of translation uh, using statistics from Transifax, obviously. But I mean, ideally, we could use that uh, some data from GitHub. But I don't think that's very possible with the tool. So I still think we shouldn't have a like human being committing all those uh, artifacts to GitHub uh, and with his name uh, as the author. No, I, I don't think that would be appropriate. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time for for this discussion, but please feel free to continue this this line of uh, questions and comments either on chat or in the the mailing list. Yeah, sure. Just raise the awareness. Yeah, thank you for doing that. All right. Thank you, everyone.